Welcome everybody to New Nug. Uh, I'd like to thank Mindfire for sponsoring the food and the location. And uh, I'd like to turn time over to Eric Olson, who's graciously agreed to come and talk to so few people about the coolness of Windebug. I'm uh, happy to be here. This isn't really the most exciting topic ever. That's probably why you have so many, so few people here, but. I think I find it exciting. Right. <laughs> There's a few people who have been really like, gunning for it that we're going to come in and didn't. <laughs> All right, so this is to talk about. So I, I've always called this windbag. I don't know why, but um, affectionately or hatefully. And, and the, this presentation is about kind of a suite of debuggers. So windbag also has a couple of companion debuggers, one's called uh, CDB and what's called NTSD, and we'll talk about all those in just a moment. But the first question is, why would you want to use this? It's kind of like equal parts, pain and power. It does a lot. It's really hard to use. There's zillions of commands. They're not super easy to remember. Um, some of the reasons that I use it is that you can X copy, deploy it into production environments. They made it. It used to be a really tiny download that you could get and easily put on a server. They've now made it part of the SDK and DDKs installed, which is complicated that greatly, but you can still install it in a machine and then just grab the bits and move them around. They don't need to be installed or registered wherever they go, so that makes it nice. So it does have a small footprint. It's fairly non-invasive. You can use it for things like automated debug attachments. Um, if you want to, for example, set your IS worker process to always run under a debugger on your development machine, you can launch it under one of these, then you connect to it remotely whenever you want to mess with it. And there are uh, uh, automated stress or perf labs where you routinely run stuff in debuggers so if anything goes wrong you immediately have a break and you can go handle whatever happened. If you're doing kernel or driver development you're pretty much stuck with this kind of set of stuff. And then the last thing, the next to the last thing is that there, all this is a wrapper around the debugger engine called debug engine and it's really easy to use or write your own tools. If you have some kind of a shop where you're doing automated stuff or you have unique or unusual debugging problems, you can write your own debugger around this engine, get all the power of these tools that you see, and then extend it with your own custom commands or things that you want to do. It's not a hard thing to do. It's really useful. Um, a lot of the teams that I've worked on in the past have written custom extensions or custom debug engines using this engine in order to solve domain-specific problems, and it was super useful and made things a lot easier. And the last piece of the puzzle for me is uh, debug extensions. There are uh, is everybody here a .NET developer? I'm assuming we have some interest in .NET code. So there are some really interesting extensions here for debugging .NET applications, and we'll take a look at a couple of them today. And it's not like using the Visual Studio debugger, but it does let you do things that are hard to do in some other environments. So those are some of the reasons why you might want to deal with pain. So the tools, again, there's WinBag, that's the graphical. All these tools have exactly the same functionality. It's just a question of how they're presented. So WinBag is the graphical UI. It does have some niceties. It can do source level debugging if you're doing uh, native code. It has um, tool windows for call stacks and things like that. We'll see some of those in just a minute if you prefer graphical presentations on things. CDB and NTSD are just console applications and they're exactly the same except CDB is a console app which uses an inherited console and ST and NTSD is a Windows app that creates its own console or a pop-up window. Typically, if you're going to run something on another desktop or as a service, you're going to use CDB and then you're going to connect to it remotely. If you have um, kind of destroyed the security on your Windows desktop and you want something to pop up on your desktop when you launch an application, then NTSD is what you want because it will create a console and if you, if you, have, you know, tweak the security to enable that thing to pop up from a service context onto your desktop, then you just have a pop-up on the desktop and run there. And then finally, there's KD, which is used for kernel debugging. Is anybody interested here in kernel debugging? But okay, cool. So maybe we'll talk about that a little bit. All these debuggers are not only servers, but they're clients. And so they can connect to other debuggers that are controlling other processes. And so you can connect to a local process, and we'll, we'll mostly do that today. You can connect to a local debugger over a named pipe. And the scenario for that, again, is that you're running a debugger or a service that launches inside of a debugger, and then you're going to connect to that from your graphical debugger so that you can control it in a little more user friendly fashion. You can use remote debuggers over TCP. For example, if you've got a stress or a perf lab in your shop and you've got a bunch of machines that are running in some kind of an ongoing context and they pop into the debuggers, you can use 
you know, a debugger on your machine to connect to those things and then debug them remotely, which is nice. If you are into kernel debugging, you can control the kernel debugger from one of these user mode debuggers and actually the other way around. And you can do it over a serial or a USB port, or if you're using Hyper-V locally, you can use COM port emulation for that to kind of hook up a virtual USB device and debug that way. And then what most people actually use it for is dump files. And so we'll talk a little bit about how to create these, but a dump file is kind of a snapshot of a running process. And you can go and take all the memory and the file handles and the thread stacks and all that kind of stuff and write them to a file, and then you can go and poke around at that file after the fact in the debugger. And this is great if you've got some kind of environment where things are crashing. For whatever reason, you can't get onto those servers and look at it in real time. You can create a dump, and then you can do it offline whenever it's convenient to do that. So those are a quick overview of some of the tools and some of the ways that you might use them. Does, um, does anybody here like have us involved in a stress or a perf program where you're running machines inside of a debugger? Or is that a scenario people care about? If not, I won't talk about that. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is symbols. These debuggers are completely useless without symbols, unless you like reading nothing but assembly code all the time. But if you can get symbols, then the debugger ends up being pretty useful, even if you don't have source. So I'll show you how to do this in just a second, but the basic idea is that there are some commands that let you set the symbol path. And if you don't know what else to do, you type dot symfix, and that goes and finds the Microsoft symbol server in the sky, which is at msdl.microsoft.com. And it will pull down all the symbols for Windows, the .NET Framework, Visual Studio, or any other kind of public symbols for Microsoft products that are out there. And if you've got that, usually you're in a pretty good place to do Windows debugging. And then if you've got your own product, either you can provide PDBs or you can actually set up your own symbol server and point this at it as well. Symbols are big. It takes a lot of time to download them. Sometimes you have to do it offline. And so you can do local caches. And the syntax that you see there on that SRV line it's saying symbol server, and then it has a local path for caching, and then it has a down or upstream remote store that it's going to use and pull the symbols from. So that line basically reads, get symbols from msdl.microsoft.com and cache them in symbols, C colon symbols. So um, if, you, if you're doing this on your dev machine or whatever, you're definitely going to want to cache symbols. It takes forever to download them, and it's worth the time to you in order to cache them locally. If it's a production machine that you hardly ever get on, you know, it may not be worth it. There is, like I said, source debugging for native code. It's dot source path is the command for that. And I'll show you what I usually do to start a session here in just a minute. But the basic idea is that you first start by looking at the symbol path. Make sure that you can get symbols. If all else fails, you do dot symfix and then dot reload to force the symbols to get pulled for the uh, Windows DLLs and other things that are loaded. And then finally, you can set the source path if you need to. So let's take a quick example of how that might work. <clears throat> I can figure out how to control this thing. All right. Actually, this is going to be kind of lame. So I've got to get this thing in here. All right. So I wrote like the world's lamest .NET application. I'll just show you what it looks like real quick. So it's just a few lines of C-sharp. It basically is going to prompt this via read lines that we have time to attach to it. It reads a file. It throws an exception. But this will let us kind of poke around with some of the debugger features, and we can see what it does. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just launch this application in the one console window down here. And then I'm going to go and use this T-list. There's a million ways to do this. T-list is some of the ships of the debug tools. It just gives you PIDs for the various processes that are running. Then I'm going to start WinBag by giving it the dash P switch and the PID of the process that I'm interested in debugging. So then WinBag will load. And I'm going to start first by looking at my symbol path. And in this case, I've already set up the symbol path. It does save things. You can't read that, can you? It's too small. Not too well. All So once I've got a symbol path, then I know that I'm going to be able to actually, I'm not sure what's going on here. 
beautiful stuff. Some funky visual artifacts from my VM. All right. Big enough to see. Okay. So the next command that you might be interested in here is this LM, and that list stands for loaded modules or list modules. And this will show me all the modules that I've got in the process, and it will show me whether or not whether or not I've got symbols for them. So this is a good way to check if you've got symbols for a given module. So I can type L and most of these commands are in the slide deck. Don't think like don't think you've got to remember them. They're extremely cryptic. This is what I was saying about the pain. But list modules verbose match, and then I can type trivial console app or whatever I'm trying to match, and I can see the specific information for that application, which is the one that I'm looking at. It says symbols are deferred, it hasn't had a chance to open yet. So just a couple of other basic commands here. If I wanted to set a breakpoint, and we'll go through this in more detail, there's this BP for breakpoint command, and I'm going to set a breakpoint on a create file. So kernel 32 create file w this is a great way to learn the windows api and i'm going to use the breakpoint list command to make sure that i actually do have a breakpoint there and that's been able to resolve it so then i'm going to use g for go and my app is now back to running instead of being broken in the debugger and then i'll go here and hit enter it will try to read the file and you can see here that my debugger is broken now i can do things like the k command is a stack trace problems with using the bigger punch. I have to do a little scrolling around. Anyway, you can see the top of the stack there is create file w where we thought we'd break and we've got a bunch of um, MS core loop frames. Those are managed code. If you see it, the MS core loop frame is managed code. There are commands like CLR stack. We'll talk about these in more detail that will give you just the managed stack frames. And so it lets you look at these things a little more easily. And you can see parameters and locals and all that kind of stuff. So we'll get to those in just a bit. But Basically, that's what WinBag looks like. Again, NTSD and CDB are the same kind of thing. And then to go again, I would just hit G. And get back to my application. It's now going to throw an exception. So it broke into the debugger with a second chance exception. And we'll talk about exception handling in just a minute. I'm going to use this bang PE command, which stands for print exception. And if you don't give it any arguments, it prints whatever the last exception on the thread was. If there happens to be one, you can see that I've got a system invalid operation exception with my really graceful message there. And I'll just go ahead and go again, hit my breakpoint, and eventually the process is done. It says terminate process, and I can quit. <clears throat> All right, so now this is going to be an interesting question. How do I get back to my Okay, so symbols are important. We saw SimPath and SimFix can be used, and that module symbol notation is something that you use all the time. So the module is the DLL or the executable with which the symbol resides, and then the symbol name is after the bang. So extensions are real. Without, without extension DLLs, this stuff probably wouldn't be worth using, but there's a lot of extensions that are built in that do all kinds of cool stuff. And one of the ones that we'll look at today is something called SOS which is used for managed code debugging. It historically comes from, there was a debugger that the CLR team wrote way back when called Strike, and SOS is son of Strike, rather than the SOS that you think of, like a cry for help, although it works for that too. And then this SOSX was written by one of the Microsoft support people, and is um, a third party, it's not shipped by Microsoft, it is widely available, and it has some neat things for doing heap inspection and checking out, um, We'll see how to look at heaps, but it makes it easier and it actually builds an index on your heap. And so if you've got a big, you know, a server that's got 60 gigs of memory, searching the heap with a debugger can take hours. <laughs> and this, you, with this, you could build an index once and then you can do quick searches after that. So that's kind of one of the major use cases for it. If you're using extension DLLs, usually bang and the name of the extension DLL.help will show you all the commands. And this dot prefer DML command, there's this this is what passes for innovation in debuggers, by the way. It's debug debugger markup language. Preferred DML basically means that when you see listings in the debugger, they'll give you hot links that you can click on. It's like you know a cheap substitute for a GUI experience. But some people like it, some people don't. I personally don't like it because it makes it harder to copy your stuff out of the debugger, but I'll, I'll show you both ways here. If you've got an extension DLL, you can load it with the dot load command or you can load it relative to a module. This dot load by 
SOS CLR is almost always what you're going to use for managed debugging. So this is load the SSX SOS extension next to the CLR.dll module. And that will always get you the correct version of SOS that is associated with the CLR that's loaded for the .NET framework. The one caveat here is that if you are debugging a newer version of the framework than you have on your machine, it will fail to load. So you need to make sure that your machine is at least as you know, uh, equivalent to the, the version, version of the CLR that you're trying to load. So you have that version of SOS. And if you use the version command, it'll show you all the extension DLLs that are loaded and all their versions and all of the debugger engine versions, which is sometimes helpful if you're trying to track down why your SS, SOS or some other extension won't load and you're trying to make sure that things match up. Is this kind of stuff useful? Too much? Too little? Great. Okay. So some basic extension commands here or inspection commands, and we'll go back and use these in just a minute. I want to call out a couple things. LM, we already saw, I use that all the time to see modules that are loaded. K is your basic stat trace. When all else fails, hit K and try to figure out where you are. This D and then some letter, D stands for dump. And so anything that comes after that is basically a mnemonic for the type of thing that you're trying to dump. DB is dump byte, DU is dump unicode string, DT is dump type. This is mostly for native code, but if you have native symbols and you've got structs or classes in C++ or whatever, DT will dump those and it will do a good job of formatting them and printing them in a way that makes sense. Um, I use DB and DU all the time to look at memory. They're similar to the memory windows in Visual Studio, where you can select the kind of display that you want on that. Um, <coughs> G is go. You can script commands to run on breakpoints. And so a really common thing to do is to say, set a breakpoint, and then evaluate some condition. And if that condition is true, do something and otherwise resume execution. So you might want to only break, for example, on a create file call if it's a file that you care about. So you might write a condition that says, if the file name is equivalent to this, then break, otherwise just go. So it's constantly used in those kinds of conditional commands in order to you know, make the debugger execution a little more efficient for you. R shows registers. This tilde lists the threads. That's another one that you use all the time. And it's also a prefix command. So you can say, for example, run this command on all threads, or run this command on a particular thread. And I'll show you how to switch back and forth and do some of those things in just a minute. Uh, that does, should, say, should not say defer pointers, but dereference pointers. If you've got a pointer that you want to dereference, POI will do that. And then this question mark and question mark, question mark, evaluate expressions. So if, you, if you're used to the VS expression window, you know, you type in something that evaluates it, this is the equivalent for WinBag. There are tool palettes for common context, stuff like um, the thread stack, locals, again, locals really only if you're using native code for managed code debugging to get the most raw possible experience. And I don't know that many people that use them for managed code debugging, but they're there and you might want to play around with them um, if you like that kind of thing. One thing that's really useful is log open. Sometimes you want to capture all the output of a debugging session, and so you can use log open with a file, and then all the commands and all the garbage that you dump out goes to that file. Then later on, you know, you can ship that off somewhere else to share it with somebody or whatever. You don't have to worry about trying to copy and paste junk out of the debugger, which is sometimes tedious. Um, there, the, this suite of debuggers is really popular with the security analysis community, and a bunch of people maintain some pretty good sites on WinBag. They're not Microsoft sites; they're third party. But this WinBag.info has got a lot of information on extensions and commands, and it's a pretty good reference for a lot of the basic debugger commands. Okay, we saw some of these, but just quickly, some of the breakpoint commands, you can add, list, disable and enable breakpoints, just like you can in all the debuggers. This next line that says breakpoints can take scripts that execute commands is kind of what I was talking about. This particular command says, set a breakpoint on create file w, and when it runs, dump as a Unicode string what's in the RCX register, and then go. Does that actually mean what's pointed at by the RCX register? Yes. That's exactly what it means. So it kind of dereferences the register. Um, and I guess we'll talk about this in just a minute. I think I've got a slide on, on calling conventions for x64. But you, you kind of, as you're doing this stuff, need, it helps if you have in your head, when you're looking at a method, where stuff is, where the compiler has put it. Um, but RCX is where the first parameter is passed in an x64 fast call calling convention. And so typically, if you're looking at the first parameter, RCX and RDX and some of those registers are, are really commonly used. 
hey, managed code breakpoints are way more complicated. And why? It's because they may or may not have been jitted when you want to set the breakpoint. If they're jitted, you have a physical you know, instruction pointer address that you can put a breakpoint on. And if not, you have to wait for it to be jitted. And so waiting for it to be jitted is a huge pain in the neck. And so the SOS has this command called BPMD, and that stands for breakpoint on metadata. And if you give BPMD a module and a type spec, and we'll have some examples of this in just a minute, then it will basically go and put a deferred breakpoint in CLR on the jitting of that method. And once that method has been jitted or resolved to a physical address, it will then insert a breakpoint on the physical address for you. And so it takes care of a lot of the pain of manipulating those breakpoints for stuff that may or may not have been jitted yet. The other wrinkle with this kind of stuff is that sometimes with .NET, you have pre-NGEN DLLs. And so um, MS Corlib is one that this is famous for. You'll have an MS Corlib NI, which stands for native image. And so sometimes setting breakpoints, you'll be trying to put a breakpoint in MS Corlib and ripping your hair out because it won't stop. It's because you're actually putting the native image instead. So you just kind of have to think about the stuff that you're doing and figure out um, why it's biting you. This next thing is also really handy. SX basically enables you to break or disable breaking on any kind of exception or AV. And if you do SSXECLR, that basically says anytime there's a first chance managed exception, handled or not, break it in the door. And so that is useful for being able to evaluate all kinds of stuff. Again, you'll get zillions of them. And so sometimes depending you have to condition code, right? What's that? Depending on the quality of the code, right? Depending on the quality. Or if you're using like RavenDB, like I do a lot, they do uh, full control through exceptions, which is not a recommended practice and is super right. annoying, but you'll get a lot. Um, AV is another common one, and SOS has this thing called stop on exception, and that will let you uh, trigger granular exceptions to break on rather than just going whole hog with SXE. To turn an exception off, you just do XSD, XX, I can't even say that, D, disable exceptions, and then you're good. All right, quick rundown of thread commands. Tilde lists all the threads. We'll walk through this again in just a second. If you want to do something on all threads, you go till the star, and then whatever command you want to run. If you want to run something on a particular thread, you go till the thread number, and then the command that you want to run. And for example, that till the 5s means switch to thread number 5. If you want to look at just managed threads, bang threads. If you want to look at the stack for all managed threads, that bang ee stack, which is an SOS extension, will show you just the stack for managed threads. And if you want to just show just managed frames, on managed threads, the dash EE switch will do that. Bang CLR stack at the bottom is really cool. It will give you parameters and locals for the CLR objects that happen to be on the stack. And there's some other ways to do that too. But these are things that you'll use all the time if you're looking at dumps and manipulating threads. Okay, before we go look at some more code, just a quick refresher on X64 calling conventions. The way Microsoft has chosen to implement this, you have a four register fast call convention and then you have stack backing. So the first four arguments will be in RCX, RDX, R8, and R9. So they're just a register so that things are fast. And if you've got more after that, then you'll start going um, stack pointer plus some offset. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, typically this is useful because as you're splunking through breakpoints or trying to output conditionals, you want to know where the data is so that you can write a rule that will do it. Let's see. All right. Let's go look at stuff, and we'll come back and talk about that. Is the .NET the C-Heckle column convention, though? Um, on x86 it is, yeah. <clears throat> and then on x64 it uses what's called uh, fast call okay. for x64. And it is, like I said, the first four registers to stack back. It, it was super, for me, it was super confusing making that transition because I had all these scripts and just ingrained habits where I would like Break on create file and I go ESP plus four, dump a pointer, and all of a sudden all that stuff didn't work. So it was a little bit of re education. Okay, so let's say we're trying to debug this same managed code process. I'm going to start it up, it hasn't done anything yet. We'll go and find the, the pin and attach to it. Okay, so let's do a couple of things, and I hope you'll forgive me for. Maybe. Maybe not. I got some commands kind of pre-baked here that I can paste in if I can figure out how the control tab's not working. 
So why did it break here? Uh, I see until you go, you go to the break point. How, was that built into your code? So when you attach to the debugger, it basically attaches to the process, it injects a thread into the process, and then it, it basically rewrites the instruction pointer on that thread to have an int3 so that you break in the debugger, and that's what you're seeing right there. I see, thank you. <clears throat> Order how it was hacking. Yep, that's what it is. Good point, I should have brought that up. Okay, here's some of the other ones. So let's say, for example, I've got this method called throw exception. So first of all, let's load SOS, and even before we do that, Let's go in here, and we, just for fun, we'll make sure we've got our sim path, it's still okay. I'm gonna type prefer DML1 so that we can get our fancy leaking. I'm gonna go load by SOS seal, oops, dot load by thingy. Dot load by SOS seal All right. So now we'll go and we'll set a breakpoint on this method with BPMD here. So again, the syntax is breakpoint metadata. This is my module, trivial console app.exe, and this is my namespace, type, and method. So you can see, it, we can do all this manually too, and if somebody's interested in it, I'll show you how to do it all manually instead of using BPMD, but this is the quick way to do it. But you can see that it found a module, it looked at the method descriptor in that module, which is that, and then it basically added a pending breakpoint, so it's got a breakpoint on the jitter for that method description, and then when this actually ends up getting jittered, it's going to go ahead and add a physical breakpoint for us. And if we say bpmd list, if I can type bpmd list, it'll show you the breakpoints that are pending there, whether or not they're resolved over the addresses. You can see that in this case, breakpoint list doesn't actually show anything uh, because we don't have any physical breakpoints set in this debugger. So just for fun, let's go in and add one of these. So we'll put another breakpoint on create file. And rather than having it stop, the way this reads again, it's breakpoint kernel 32, bang create file w. So it's module and, and symbol that's exported. This du is a dump a Unicode string. The first parameter to create file is the file name you're trying to open. And that gets passed in the first register for x64. So that's RCX. And then it's going to do a stack trace and then go again. So we won't expect the debugger to break for this, we'll just expect to, accept, expect to see spew in the debugger that indicated that that got called. So then we should be able to see the breakpoint there along with the args and that looks good. Let's see a couple more things that we wanted to do. We wanted to turn on managed exceptions. So SX enable CLR. Um, was there anything else? Oh, I was gonna show you how to look at threads. So that shows me all the threads in the process. You can see down here, I'm on thread four. Does that make sense? And if you're on a big server that's got hundreds of threads, you know, you'll see a bunch of those things there. And if I wanted to switch to say thread zero, I would use that notation. And you can see that I switched to thread zero there, down on the left hand corner. And if I wanted to say do a stack on all threads, again, I can do tilde, which is the thread indicator, star is the selector, and then k, and that'll give me a stack trace on all threads. This little thing here is the hyperlinking on the threads, and that will basically does a dot frame. It depends on whoever whoever wrote the debugger extension decided what it's going to do. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not so much. Um, again, bang threads will show me the managed threads in the process. In this case, this process hasn't done a lot, so I've only got two managed threads. Bang ee stack will give me all of the manage stack traces for all of those threads. And if I want to, again, just look at just the managed code stuff, I can do the dot ee, the dash ee, and that'll give me just the managed frames. And you can see I've got that one sitting down there in read line, which is the console.readline that we call. And here's my code right here, this debug trivial main thing. <clears throat> all right, so we've got a few breakpoints set. We're gonna go ahead and hit go. We'll go and kick this out down the road. All right, so we expect to see this app hit our breakpoint here, so we can see create file w. It did that du, or it dumped the string, so we can see that this is the file that it was trying to open, and then it kept going. I actually use these conditional debug stuff, um, or this 
breakpoints that don't do anything just for logging purposes all the time. Like this is something I'll go and hook a debugger up to a process where we're trying to figure out what's going on and just let it run for a long time spewing out to a log file and it'll go back and figure out what it did. There, there are other ways to do that, but you can kind of get pretty surgical with the stuff that you care about with this, which is nice. All right, so we'll go ahead and go a little bit further. Go through the next read line here. So the next thing that happened was that we had our managed breakpoint hit. So down there you can see it jitted, trivial console app, and then it set by breakpoint. This was the BPMD command that we ran. So it waited for the jitting and then it put a breakpoint on the physical address. And then you can see that I ended up breaking on that method. And let's go ahead and look at the stack here. We've got dump stack for managed stacks. And it's big. But you can see my methods at the top of that stack like we expect. And if we do CLR stack, dash p, that'll give us all the parameters to the stack. So you can see here that this message parameter was passed, and that gives me the address for that object. I'm going to show you a couple more SOS commands here. This is the, the most common command. DO stands for dump object. And I'll give it the address of an object. Uh, what am I doing? Oops, that was a classical out of this. Did I not copy it? Or am I speeding it? Let's see. This is an example of the hot pinky getting in the way. Yeah, this is exactly an example of the hot pinky getting in the way. So if I paste that in, it comes with the hot linking. <laughs> So that slash D that it's injecting for me, that says use DML. We're just going to do it this way. Okay, so that'll show me it. Now I've got a system.string. In this case, it showed me um, <coughs> Is that an empty string? I'm not sure it looks like an empty string. It looks like string array with one object inside of it. Yeah, maybe I don't know what I'm looking at here. Hang on. You're absolutely right. Did I get args? Okay, so I grabbed args, which is the, the command line args to the program, and you're right. And what I really wanted was this right here. Thanks for catching me. Am I on the right one? Great. Let's see if I have that one. Yay, there's a string. You can see it says bang. And if you look at the string, you can see that we've got an, off, an offset 8. That's actually where the string starts. And so if I were to just go du, again, for dump unicode string, dang it. Get a bunch of extra crap in there. This is why you don't like that DML thing, like you said. And then say plus, o, oops, plus ox8. Expected either. Huh, I'll have to think about that for a second. Later. Anyway, that'll let you dump the string, but the dump object here, dump object on that will basically show you the fields and values of managed code objects, and it knows about quite a few of those. I'm not sure why that doesn't exist at the outset, but I think it should exist at, but I'll figure that out. Here. Um, okay, a couple of other things. This DSO command will show you all the objects on the stack. It stands for dump stack objects. And then if you're using the DML, you can just kind of go click on them, you know, to get the same kind of dump object thing that we just saw. So before you move on, I'm curious. Yeah. So your plus eight there says it is type in 32. Says it's what, sorry? Type in 32. Oh, it's the string length. So I would be right. I am just being an idiot. So what I want is not OA, it's OC. Thank you. <laughs> Looking at the wrong field. So sometimes that's useful for commands too when you don't want to load SS, SOS if you want to script some of those commands into the debugger. A couple of other things that I wanted to call out here. Let's run dump heap dash stat. This will basically run an analysis of the managed code heap, and it will show all the objects on the heap. This can obviously be really, really big. And if you go to the top, you can see that it gives us a method table, a count, and a total size. 
And then the hot linking here on the method table, let's find one that's got something that we don't have a million of that we actually can look at. Speedwriters, too many strings. Oh wait, that's not an exception there. Let's go look at this guy. So this will basically examine the heap looking for those objects of that method table. And then you can see that here we've got the address for that object. And if there were more than one, we'd have more than one in the method table. And then if we click on that, it'll dump that particular object. This was an exception. It's a system by exception. It's got no message, no exception string, or anything else. So it must be something that is hanging out waiting to be used. OK, so that was dump stack objects and dump heap. You can also do dump heap dash type exception, for example, and search the heap for particular types of objects. That's really useful if you're trying to look at memory leaks and things like that. I want to point out a couple of things there. One, you'll, you'll see an execution engine exception, a stack overflow exception, and a memory exception. The CLR creates one of those when the process starts up so that it always has memory to create those and it needs to throw one. So you're pretty much always going to see those things hanging out. Sometimes people get freaked out if they go my app ran out of memory, but typically that's not the case. Um, that's the same for a thread board exception on that one. There are a bunch of things that you can do with dump heap. Again, you, I typically start with stat or type to look at the things that I want. Let's see, we see string. You can do the same kind of thing, it'll match anything with string. Oh, that's what I was going to do. So let's go find one of those objects. Whatever, let's just pick one of these. OK, so this is a string. It looks like it's the name of the MS Corlib file. Let's go ahead and copy this. Maybe. Another cool command is Bang refs, which basically will show you all the objects that hold a reference to a given object. And so if you're looking again for memory leaks, this is one of the, the major tools that you'll use, is find the things that are leaking, then figure out who's holding on to those with bang refs. Okay, so we are broken in a method. This is the native stack trace with K. I was going to go look at a couple of these tool palettes. Again, I don't really find these that useful with native code. If you look at locals, you'll see, we, or with managed code, you'll see we've got nothing because it doesn't know about any native locals. Registers works fine. Call stacks will give us that same native call stack that we saw there. You can switch frames in it by double clicking on one. If you go and look at threads, this is probably the most useful one, processes and threads. You can switch threads around. Um, a couple more commands there on threads. This isn't really applicable to this application, but another cool command is bang locks, which will go and basically scan the CLR heap for any locks that happen to be held. And if you use the dash V, it'll output all the locks. And again, if you're trying to find deadlocks and processes or things that are piled, you've got multiple threads piled up on a lock, this is super useful for being able to analyze all the locks in the process and figure out how many waiters there are in each particular lock and which threads there are. We don't have any here. Monitor locks here. What's that? Are we talking monitor locks here? It's a Windows critical section, and a monitor lock actually uses one of those. So in this case, it is, yeah. Um, let's go ahead and go on. So I'm going to hit go again, and the next thing that will happen is that our exception that was in the code ran. So you can see that we got, this was SXE CLR. This is the result of having that. We've got a first chance managed exception. If I do bang PE, I can see the exception object. Again, I could dump that thing. If I needed to look at it deeper, if there were inner exception, in this case there's not, or something like that, we could find that and drill down. One thing that's kind of cool is that you can actually write these little scripts. We've got a for each loop here that will go through the entire heap and dump exceptions. Again, it's kind of irrelevant in this particular case. But this would you know, walk through all the heap and find any exceptions that happen to be there and dump those. Again, if you're looking at a, a dump or a diagnostic from a large server, this is useful for figuring out what's going on. So in this case, we know what the exception is, but we could run all the same commands again, bang CLR stack or 
bang DSO to look at the objects on the stack to try to figure out why that exception happened to get thrown. And then when we're ready to move on, we just hit go again. This was an unhandled exception, so we get a second chance one, and then the process exits. Really exciting. Uh, any questions about that? Or things that you'd like, like techniques that you might be interested in? That was cool. <laughs> All right, let's go. I've got a couple more slides. We can go through those and then move on. If anybody wants to try anything else in the debugger, we can go back there and do some more. So some of these we've seen already. That bang PE is print exception. It's really useful for dumping the last exception on the thread or taking arbitrary addresses and dumping those. Bang DO is the managed dump object. Is the, the, you know, the, if you don't know what you've got, start with bang DO and that'll dump it and you'll be able to get the most information from that. We saw a dump stack and CLR stack. CLR stack gives you locals, args, or both, so that's pretty useful. We saw dump heap. Again, you can use that with dash stat, dash type, to search the heap for particular kinds of things. If you don't, it'll just give you a summary of everything on the heap. That DA, bang DA, dumps arrays. And name 2 ee is a resolver. So given, I thought I had a better example for that, sorry. Given a module name and a symbol, it will search that module for those symbols and then it will show you managed stuff that matches. And so if you're trying to find you know, methods or types inside of a managed module, name 2 ee will help you resolve those and turn them into native addresses that you can then do things with. We saw bang threads, we saw bang DSO, which is dump stack objects, and that stop on exception and BPMD are really useful for setting managed breakpoints or, or uh, setting breakpoints on discrete exceptions as well. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do with SOS, and it is, again, I wouldn't, I don't see any reason using WinBag without that. It's a really handy thing to have. Okay, a few other things. These are mostly native debugging. Sometimes you use these in web applications, and they can be useful. We saw bang locks already. Bang token will show you the security token on a thread. In fact, let's go back and do that real quick. If you do a lot of Windows debugging, and you're using, um, Windows integrated security, you always run into problems with tokens, right? You're trying to access files or resources or whatever, and it's a pain in the neck to figure out what is going on with that. So <clears throat> here, if we just go type bang token, it tells us whether or not the thread's impersonated. It will dump all the SIDs and the privileges in the token, and it's a pretty handy way to get an idea of the security context of the thread pretty quickly. And so that is nice to have when you're doing, uh, again, server application debugging. Usually for client stuff, it doesn't matter too much. If you get a crash dump from someone, and it actually was taken at the time the process dump, so a process crashes, it's sitting there in a crash state, someone grabs a dump, you run analyze dash V, and it will basically look at all the threads and find anything in a faulting state, so if there are AVs, if there are exceptions, and then it will report on those and give you a nice summary that tries to find the victim or the, the culprit, I should say. If it can find like a bucket of code that was actually responsible for the AV, then it will output that. It's really more useful with native code than it is managed code, but it's there if you need it. Bang Runaway is kind of cool. It will show you the times taken by each thread. Here, the app hasn't run, so it's completely useless. But again, on a server app, where you're trying to find hotspots or figure out which thread is responsible for doing something bad, Bang Runaway can really show you what's going on inside the process. And I use that quite a bit when I'm debugging iOS applications. Um, Bang Unique Stack will show you, kind of collapses all the like stacks, and it'll say you've got eight stacks that look exactly like this. And then it will show you the ones that look different. And so if you've got a really big process, it's useful to be able to look at the stacks in a summarized way. And a lot of times you'll have the process or stacks that are all waiting in the same call thread on events or monitors or whatever. And so that will help you winnow out some of the noise from those. I'm not going to talk much about these, but there is this scripting language. You could write scripts. It's the worst scripting language ever. It's even worse than Vim, if you can believe that. You can put them in external files and then it will <coughs> execute those things, or you can execute them uh, manually if you want. Similarly, with conditional breakpoints, there's a little meta language there that you can embed inside of those breakpoint descriptions, and it will let you conditionalize those. 
I can never remember this. I don't use it enough anymore to remember that kind of stuff, so I have to look it up every single time I use it. But the docs are there, and it is useful if you find yourself using it a lot. Um, are people here pretty experienced with creating memory dumps? Is it worth talking about that? I don't see that. <laughs> so there's, there's a couple things that you can do. If you're in a debugger on a live process, dot dump will create a mini dump dot dump slash ma will create a full dump. When in doubt, create that slash ma. That will give you handles, um, all of the memory, and basically everything that you need to have a good managed debugging experience in the post-mortem process. A real, it, it, they're huge, but like a real mini dump doesn't really give you anything other than thread stacks. And so if that's all you're after, do that. But if you really need to look at memory or anything, then you want a full dump. There are lots of tools that do this. Process Explorer is, I mean, generally awesome for all kinds of stuff. They can create dumps. AD Plus ships with the debug pools, tools. My favorite is actually Proc Dump. It's really easy to use. And it comes from sys internals, like everything else that those guys do. It's pretty good. So you type Proc Dump takes the same exact arguments as the debug, um, the dot dump command does. So I'm going to do notepad2.exe there. I'm going to type proc dump dash ma in the name of the process, and that'll give me a dump file. So then if I, if I can type, so then if I go into winbag and I use the dash z command, I can then attach to that dump file, and most of the debugging that I could have done live, I can now do on that dump file. I have all the threads, I have all the memory, and I can go in and poke around that thing. And if I have somebody with problems on a server, or in some other application, I'll almost always try to get them to get a dump first. And then I'll start poking around at that dump, and I really only resort to live debugging it in kind of the most dire need. Usually you can solve things from a dump. People will tell you to take a dump, and they'll just say, like, yeah, take a dump in the process. It is totally invasive. It will suspend all the threads in your process. If you have a busy database server, and you take a dump of it, that thing is down for quite a while. Because it you know, will freeze each thread and then write out the memory. And then only after it's written gigs of memory to disk does it unfreeze the threads and let the process go on. It will recover. And usually it's OK, but it will definitely cause some collateral damage if, it, if it's a process that's in action. So I want to make sure you're aware of that. Less so than debugging it. Yes, definitely <laughs> less so than debugging it. We had an infamous in incident at my work where we were working with a, a vendor, happened to be the guy that runs RavenDB. And we had. 120 gig heap or something like this, and it was on a busy production server. He told one of our ops guys to take it down on it, and the site was down for 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, the dump was right. So be aware of that kind of stuff. Um, debuggers don't care if it's a running process or a dump. Some of the stuff that you can do in running processes isn't available in dumps, but most of it is. You do need symbols. And so if, if it's on a different kind of server or whatever, you need to be able to do your sim fix and your sim path and make sure that you can pull down the symbols for the environment in which the dump was taken so that you can debug it locally. It gets, again, these tools are just no use without any, or no good without any symbols at all. You can totally automate dumps with all kinds of tools. You can set conditions inside of Windows to generate dumps. Um, if your process crashes, things like IS's process manager can also play along with that. So it's pretty easy to get dumps in a production environment if things are blowing up. If they're not blowing up again, you can get them as long as you're willing to tolerate a little bit of downtime. Okay, the last, this might be the last slide that I had, maybe not, is a tool called LiveKD. And this is another awesome tool from Mark, Mark Rasinovich, and it's basically a local kernel debugger. For a long time, people thought you couldn't pull this off because a kernel debugger by default freezes all everything. You know, you're, you're attached over a serial connection, and the machine is dead, and then you run commands in the kernel debugger, and then if you let it go, you know, then and break it again, it has to stop everything in order to get a coherent look at the process. And like KD can't do stepping or any of that kind of stuff, but it can do almost all the inspection that a real kernel debugger can do. Um, you know, I don't think most developers use this typically, but it's really handy when you need it. You do have to set up symbol paths and some of that kind of stuff, and I don't have those set. But it is, it's a handy tool. You could set it up if people are interested in that. I'd be happy to show you how to use it. Some of the things that you use commonly in it, you can look at this bang process. It'll show you all the processes in the system. If you then give it a process address, it will dump all of the handles, 
threads, security scripters, and whatnot for that process. Um, bank thread does the same thing on the thread level, and bank pad will dump the environment block for a process. Like most people that aren't working with drivers don't care about this. Once in a blue moon, it's useful for something like HTTP.sys or something like that. But if you end up doing driver work or that kind of stuff, it is really useful. Um, I've worked a lot of machines trying to figure that out. It's really nice for that kind of stuff. So this is just a, a summary of some of the commands that we've already seen. Dumpy-stat will again show you by method table all of the different types that are on the heap. It'll show you the count and size of each of those. You can then, using the method table that you got from the last one, go do a dump heap dash method table with that method table and it'll show, show you all the instances of that type. So that's a good way to find all the you know, strings or whatever it is that you're looking for inside of the heap. <clears throat> These are a couple of techniques that I use for looking for exceptions. Again, I'll use dash MT for the particular exception type. If you're using dump heap dash type exception, it will give you all exceptions, so it's a little less granular, but it's a little bit easier to do. So sometimes that's useful. And then you can use a script like the one below to actually dump all the exceptions if there aren't too many, and take a look at them that way. And there's the caveat that we had about um, some of the build-in exceptions that the CLR creates just so they can work in panic memory situations. So any Questions, comments, stuff that would be cool to look at. I know this is like one of those things, there's like a million commands. Unless you go really spend some time kind of mucking around in it, it's hard to remember any of it. But if, if you do a lot of production debugging or low level debugging of .NET code, then I think it, it pays for itself in the end. If you don't, it's not worth looking at it at all. Yeah. How much of this stuff can uh, Visual Studio debugger you versus Windows up? That's a good question. So Visual Studio Debugger is way, way, way better if you're doing source level debugging. No question. It can load dumps. It can do all the thread analysis, all the analysis of locals and parameters, anything on the stack, basically. It will read a memory dump and it'll do a lot of this. Visual Studio used to be able to run SOS. I'm under the impression that that's no longer the case, but I'm a couple of versions behind and I don't know the truth of that statement. I don't know if anybody does. But it used to be in the immediate window in Visual Studio, you could go in and type bang load, and then the path SOS. And it would actually load it, and then you could run the SOS commands inside of the Visual Studio debugger. And I was told, again, I'm out of date, I was told that I quit working in Visual Studio 2013. I don't know why they would break that. I thought it was super useful. Um, trying to think of other things. It wouldn't have, it, it never, at least in my experience, it never did the other extensions that weren't SOS, but they did at least try to make SOS work with it. But um, most, most of the people that I know that do any kind of application level debugging would always use Visual Studio for that and only use this kind of stuff for production issues or memory leaks or other things where you're kind of doing more detailed troubleshooting. <coughs> well, also, this will do kernel and Visual yeah. Studio build. Right. There's other things in there. Yeah. But yeah, Visual Studio does uh, unmanaged debugging as well, right? It does, yeah. It does a really good job of it. It's, it's a good debugger. But, so, um, I, learned, I worked on the Microsoft uh, CLR team for quite a while, and then I worked on the IS team for quite a while after that. And we exclusively used this kind of stuff because we were always working in an environment where Visual Studio wouldn't work on top of the version of the CLR on which we were building, because it was always unstable to death. And so, um, you know, we kind of made do with this kind of stuff, and it worked okay. But it, anybody else who wasn't in that situation would use Visual Studio as a preference. They actually had this really cool tool called Rascal, which I don't think ever made it out like outside of Microsoft, but it was the Visual Studio debugger with the extensions without anything else. And so that was a really cool thing, and we used to use that quite a bit too, but um, I haven't seen it running around recently. Did you, have you tried playing with the, uh, what's the Visual Studio 15 wide installer that you could actually install on a production machine? And I haven't. I have to confess complete ignorance on that. Is that that sounds cool though? Yeah. Have you, have you tried it? I haven't tried it yet because I don't do much Windows development. Yeah, they were. They did some demos of it. You can build it like 16. That's pretty like an editor to install it. That sounds kind of like what Rascal was. I wonder if that's related to that. That's interesting.
any other questions, comments? Appreciate you sitting through this much debugger talk. <laughs> if anyone ends up using this and has questions, I'd be delighted after the fact to try to help with any of it. I actually, I don't get to do this stuff very much anymore, but I, I don't do much Windows development anymore either, but I enjoy it when I get a chance. What about the <clears throat> system crash stuff? What's the best way to figure out what's going on with those? So if you're getting like a blue screen that generates a mini dump file, you can load those in live KDE and do the same kinds of things. I would start with bang analyze, that, that command that we saw before, and it will typically, if it's a system level crash, it can point at the faulty driver. And if it's a, if it's a Microsoft driver or something that ships in Windows that you can get symbols for, you usually can get a pretty good idea of what's causing the crash. If it's some random third party one, maybe not so much. I just remember I kept on getting a IRQ reader, less, you know, the dispatch yeah. uh, debug check. And I, I knew it was my video card driver, but I couldn't prove it. <laughs> yeah, if, if you have your Windows set to generate mini dump files when that happens, then um, loading those into Live KD, or you get, you don't even use Live KD for that, you just use NTSC or WinBag or whatever you want. And then just use running bang analyze dash V on it will probably give you a pretty good idea of where the where that will happen. And if it's a, like I said, if it's a module that ships with symbols, you'll have a pretty good idea where it is. Okay. Cool. Well thank you.